Hey, thanks for watching. We're going to jump right in. If you started reading your Bible at the very beginning, it starts in Genesis, which means beginning. The second book you get to is Exodus, and it tells this story about the children who were called the children of Israel, God's people who were set free. And when it does, we very quickly come to a very familiar place. Even if you have a, don't have a church background, this is pretty familiar stuff because there was a guy named Moses who, who led his people and God took Moses up on a mountain and he gave him some instruction and he came back down the mountain with a couple of tablets at the top of them. This is the instructions. It said, then God gave the people these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. He reminds them, don't forget who I am. And I'm about to tell you something really important. And then he says this, you must not have any other God but me. He starts and says, listen, this is huge. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you some other commandments, but all of the other commandments don't work unless this one's in place. I want you to put me first, no other gods but me. In other words, maybe you would say it this way, I want you to love me completely. And then he gave them nine more that kind of, maybe we could say it this way, kind of just hang on this one. But once again, if the one's not right, the nine won't matter. The truth is, if you were any little kid that goes to school, any little Jewish kid that was growing up in that world, and you were to ask them, what is the greatest commandment in Exodus 20 days, they would have said, love God completely. They would have all known these words, love God. If you'd asked a little fourth grade Jewish boy, wait, what's the number one that everything else hangs on? Love God completely. If you had asked an old one, love God completely. Old man, love God completely. If you had asked people wherever you were in your world, love God completely. It was so obvious. And then there were nine more. And then on top of that, there were like 600. We'll let this represent. It's not that many, but you know, uh, inflation. 600 plus more laws that were built. This then this, then these. All of those laws were set to carry out this one thing, though. Put God first. Put me first, he would say. As the one who's rescued you, put me first. As you begin to look at all of the things going on in the world, they, they were told someday there's someone coming who is going to be the savior of your world and he's going to change things. But for now... Love God completely is it. And then Jesus, thousands of years later, Jesus comes along and he lands on planet Earth. And when he starts walking around and talking to people, he says things that point back to this, but he keeps talking about a new way that's coming, a new way that he's ushering in, a new thing that he's bringing. We're in a series right now called The Greatest Summer Ever, and we're talking about greatest, things that are greatest in the Bible. If you had asked somebody in Exodus 20, the greatest commandment, love God completely. Put him first before anyone else. If you had talked to the people in Jesus' day, they would have still been pointing back to that. And then Jesus came along and he kept saying things that were different. It was, he said there's big changes coming and it drove the religious people crazy. Change and religious people don't always go together well. It's why sometimes when you go to church, you feel like you've stepped back about 80 years in time. is because change and religion don't go together well. As a result, he made a lot of enemies. The main enemies he made were religious people. There were two groups of religious people. The Pharisees, they were teachers of the law. That's what all of this was, teachers of the law. Pharisees, very religious, very judgmental. And another group called the Sadducees, they sort of looked the same on the outside, but had a few different beliefs. They didn't necessarily like each other, but they had one thing in common. They didn't like him. They didn't like Jesus. Their common bond was doing away with him. And so they planned everything they did. They planned to find ways to make Jesus look bad, lose popularity, and eventually lead to getting him off of the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, check out this verse. We're all the way over in Matthew 22. It says, Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus. You've got to not like somebody a lot when you have meetings to plot just how to trap them. It sounds a little like our political world today, this whole thing does to me. How to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent someone, uh, they sent some of their disciples. Here's what they did. They figured out Jesus' schedule, 
when they saw where he's going, they'd send some of their people to sit among the crowd, they'd listen to him teach, and then they'd raise their hand and they'd ask questions during the Q&A. And the whole goal of the question was to get him to say something that they could make a big deal out of to discredit him, to push people away from him, and eventually to have him arrested and killed. Their goals were simple. They just wanted to trap him. And so over and over, they did that. Well, the Pharisees, they sent somebody in, in one of those, and Jesus is teaching. And when Jesus gets through teaching, they ask him a question. And the question was pretty important for their day. Matter of fact, teacher, they said, we know how honest you are, and you teach the way of God truthfully. So they start off with doing this, to which somebody sitting in the crowd has to go, Brown knows much? You know, seriously, wipe that off. They start out just schmoozing him. Oh, we know you are just awesome. You are so good. You're so smart. You're so intelligent. You're so truthful about everything. And you're never impartial and you don't play favorites. And the whole reason he's saying this stuff is he's setting Jesus up. He's going to ask him a question and the question is going to make Jesus say something. And when he says it, he's in trouble. And the question that he asked him, ridiculously enough, is like an IRS question, like a tax question. And Jesus immediately answers it, does like a coin trick, confuses the guy, eventually just gets up and leaves. It totally doesn't work. To which you would say, I don't know that I would mess with Jesus. Because he seemed to win about one out of one times. But that wasn't the end of the story. As a matter of fact, a little while later, the Sadducees, because this guy came back and it didn't work, the Sadducees are like, it's our turn. Next man up, five, tag team. They go into the ring, and they come up with this question. It's kind of a riddle. Jesus is going to teach when he gets through teaching. I want you to raise your hand and ask this. So they've got a plant there. And when he gets through teaching, the guy stands up. He says, could I ask a question, sir? Oh, teacher, teacher, could I ask a question? Yes, yes, you, I see you. Young. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. It's the riddle that they're He's telling this story that's going to land in a riddle. And it's weird. It's, this was the law back then, by the way. It was one of these 600 things that were under here. It said if a man dies, that his brother should marry the widow, which is just, ooh. But it's what it was in that day. It was meant because women were so vulnerable in that day, they'd be so taken advantage of, and they wouldn't be able to carry on the family name. And so that's what you're supposed to do. It's just the way it was. It was a, probably a good thing, intended for a good purpose. But that wasn't the end of the story. Matter of fact, as he stood up, he said, okay, so say a man has, there's seven brothers, and he marries his wife, and then he dies. So brother number two takes this wife. And brother number two dies and so brother number three takes this widow and he dies and so brother number four takes this wife but he dies and brother number five and dies and brother number six marries and dies and brother number seven marries this woman and dies just stop for a minute i don't know what she's doing but she's either really good at it or really bad at it I'm saying if you had had an eighth brother, I would have been found a AWOL, you know? Seven brothers, seven dead, and then here's the way the story wraps, and then she dies. And so this man who was a Sadducee comes to his riddle, his question, so in the afterlife, Jesus, teacher, who will she be married to? Who will be her husband? To which all of the crowd is like, well, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> I do wonder. Suppose all of those things happen, and then what will happen? Well, here's a little background to the story. The Sadducees asked this question because they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe, they believed that you live, you die, you rot, and it's done. You know what? That's why they were called sad. You see? That's Bible humor. You should have laughed. It was better than what any of you did. They didn't believe in it. They're trying to get him to take sides. And what Jesus did is he answered them in a way that he often did that really ticked them off. He said, if you understood the scripture, if you just studied the scripture more, to which they would have to say, that's what we do. We're experts in the scripture. If you understood it more, you would understand the answer to this. And he explains it in that long, 
right? He goes all the way back to Abraham. And the guy gets up and leaves completely frustrated. Well, the crowd that's watching, they're the most interesting part of the story. The crowd heard him and they were astounded at his teaching. One, they were thrilled that the mega religious people, the judgmental, hypocritical religious leaders had been shown up. They love that. They're like, "Woo, good answer. But another part said, don't mess with this guy. They were astounded at his teaching. They were blown away at his wisdom. He knew what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and it seemed to be true. Well, fast forward a little bit more. That didn't work, so now they sit down together and now they're getting more desperate. As a matter of fact, the next thing we read, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. And this time they're getting more serious. And this one's getting to the biggest question for us today. It says one of them, who was a lawyer, he was an expert in the religious law. So he's sitting in the crowd and Jesus finished. He raises his hand. Yeah, I see you. Jesus had to know it was coming because well, he's Jesus. That always helps. He says, teacher, he asked a question. This is the easiest question in the world. By the way, the reason he asked this question was because he had another question to follow up. If you ever watch like press conferences, it's what you, I have a, I have a question and a follow up, please. He asked the question. The question was easy. Everybody would know the answer. You know the answer. The question was this, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Which is the top hanger? Every Jewish kid in second, third, fourth, fifth grade knew the answer to this. You know the answer to this. We just did it. Love God completely. Make him the most important part. He knew it, but he was waiting on something else. Matter of fact, listen to Jesus' response. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. And so Jesus takes it to here. He said, let me take down all of these, and I'm going to tell you the greatest commandment. Here it is. I want you to love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul and mind. It's the first and greatest command. To which everybody there was already mouthing it. They were going, yes, we know. Dumb question, easy answer, lay up. Jesus does that. But when he finishes, he doesn't put a period at the end of that as much as he does. He finishes that, that statement and he goes, and? To which this guy's got to go, no, 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 and. I've got to follow up quite, and? I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I want you to love God completely. And then he throws this in. The second is equally important. That's really important, the way he says it. It's not saying the second like there's one and then two that hangs off of that one. He said the first, the first one is the greatest and the second one is of equal importance. It's second in sequence, but not second at importance. Does that make sense? So he's saying, here's the first one, love the Lord, love God completely. And the second one, equal to the first one. So he puts this one all the way up here. He says, just like there's a greatest commandment, I'm now saying there's two greatest commandments. Love God completely and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, this guy can't sit and talk about that. This is uncharted territory. He doesn't have a snappy comeback or another question. He's like, oh, okay. Well, there you have it. And when he says that, these two things have never been put together in Scripture side by side as the greatest anything. This is Jesus saying there's new things coming. There's new things happening. I'm changing the way it was. And he's leaving these breadcrumbs for them saying, I'm pointing toward what's coming and I'm getting you there step by step because I don't know if you could take it all at once. And so he says, First, love God completely. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. This is interesting because of two things for me. It may not be interesting to you. I geek out over stuff. One, love your neighbor. It wasn't many days later that somebody asked Jesus, because of this statement, who's your neighbor? And he wanted to sing a song or do a dance or something, but instead he told a story. And he tells a story about a good Samaritan, about a man. In this day, before this question this statement and this question, your neighbor had always, all the way back in Leviticus, back in one of these things that were in the old law, your neighbor was other Jewish people. It was written to Jews, so it was other Jewish people. It was people who were like you. People that would look like, sound like, be culturally friendly with where you are. That's what your neighbor meant. 
So there had always been a definition. Well, how do you love them? They answer that question. He answers that like you love yourself. So who is your neighbor, other Jews, and care about them the same way you care about you? So it gives two definitions. Well, a few days later, somebody asked, what is your neighbor? And he said, here's another new thing. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is completely different. It's not a person who looked like him or was just like him. He found somebody who had been robbed and beaten. A person who probably wouldn't even want to have anything to do with him. And he took care of him and showed love to him and showed compassion to him. And all of a sudden, Jesus follows up and says, that's your neighbor. Now your neighbor is not someone who's like you. Now your neighbor is anyone in humanity who has a need that you can meet. That changes everything. I'm serious, it doesn't sound like that big a difference. It was that big a difference. For these people to hear that and see that was such a change, he's saying now, love God completely and love your neighbor as yourself and your neighbor is now identified as humanity. It's whoever you come across that has a need with which you can help. It begins to change everything and now one more fast forward and then we'll stop. Then we fast forward to the end of Jesus' time on earth. The last week he's on earth before his crucifixion, the last days, the last day before his crucifixion. And he calls all his friends that are closest to him, his followers that are closest, his disciples, up into a room, and they're to celebrate Passover. Passover points us way back to Moses again. Passover was when they put the blood above the doorpost and did all those things to represent God, God uh, offering them another sacrifice so they would not have to lose their life. That's what Passover was. Well, he brings them all up for Passover, but he doesn't do Passover stuff. As a matter of fact, he begins to do all kinds of weird things, like he washed their feet, freaked them all out. They're like, this is the most weird thing that's ever happened, you doing that with us. And then he told them about some things that were going to happen, about his blood being, being spilled and his body being broken, but it wasn't being spilled and he wasn't broken. He was sitting right there with them. And they were, he was looking forward and they were kind of confused. And then he told them that one of them, as a matter of fact, one of them gets up and leaves from the room. His name is Judas and he goes and betrays Jesus because these same guys that had been looking for him, they were going to put him away and they were waiting for the moment when it wasn't a crowd around. And Judas said, I can let you know, I'm on the inside, give me a little cash, I'll help you out. Judas leaves to go betray Jesus. And in the middle of all of that, Jesus has one more thing he needs to tell them before he's done. It's not going to sound huge to you. In the world, in the history of the world, this is one of the two or three hinge points that changes everything. I wish we could understand as people who sit in padded chairs or in, in, in your home or in your car or watching your phone or however you're watching this right now, I wish we could understand how huge this moment was. He said before that all of the law and the prophets held on these two things, but now a new command, he said. The only person who could give a new command was God, so part of what he was saying is, I am God in flesh. A new command I give you. In other words, it was ten commandments, really that hung on one commandment, nine others, and six hundred more to help. And then he said there's two commandments, and then all of a sudden he makes another statement. He said, a new command, singular, I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus all of a sudden brings this one thing, the one commandments. If they had sent it down on the tablet, it would have been so much lighter. <laughs> the one commandments. And he says, there's one thing I want to give you. I want you to love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. He's sitting with these guys. They don't understand everything that's going on. He goes, before anything else happens, I'm going to give you. This is a new covenant, a new command. This is a new way of life. This is a change to all of the systems. All of the other hangers are yesterday's news. He said, I'm going to give you one command and one only. If you get confused about how to do things, this will be easy because you've only got one job to do. And the one commandment, he said, I want you to love one another. To which they go, okay, yeah, we've heard that before. Matter of fact, you said it you know, a couple of months ago. So that's not new. But he didn't finish. 
Before he said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself, and your neighbor was another Jewish person, and then we redefine neighbor as whoever is out there that you can help. So love anybody as you would help yourself. But now he redefines it again. He said, I want you to love one another, and how I want you to do it is how I've loved you. Well, that's a whole different deal. If you ever ask, how do you love somebody better? Here would have been his answer, the same way God loved you. That's how I want you to do it. It's how I want you to carry it out. Here's the truth of it. If you don't understand the Bible, this will help you so much because this spot in John 13, Jesus lands and says there is a new way of life and it's for people from this day forward, he would have said. We're in the forward. He said, this is the one commandment, love one another just as I have loved you. And then the rest of your Bible from there forward is a whole list of applications. When you read through the Bible, what you're going to notice is over and over again, it helps us apply this one verse. There's a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul, who wrote much of the rest of the Bible past this, as he writes in it, and he talks about this is what love is. If we say it's love, but it doesn't consist of these things, it's just a bunch of noise, it's just a bunch of fake, it's just a bunch of pretense. And then he goes through what love is, and he gives all these things. And it's all pointing to this. How do you love your neighbor, as, uh, how do you love others as Christ loved you? He's just explaining it. Matter of fact, he wrote in this over and over. He seemed to get this better than anyone else did. As a matter of fact, at one point in Ephesians 4, he said, I want you to be kind and compassionate to one another. For some people, they're like, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. For other people, they go, man, I suck at that. Kind and compassionate, I'm not good at that. That's what my mama did. That's not what I do. That's what that guy, that's what, that's not me. And he said, it has to become you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. I don't want to forgive. Here's why you do it, or the way you do it, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I don't want you to forgive like you forgive. I don't want you to do as to others. It's not the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's not, I've replaced it with now. I want you to love others as I have loved you. This is a whole new deal. I've shaken up the whole system. I've taken all the complicated of one followed by nine followed by 600 and something more. And I replaced it with two, and now I'm bringing it down to this. For anybody who gets confused, the one commandment is love the people around you the way that God has loved you. And Paul keeps bringing this in. Just as in Christ, God, how do I forgive him? You know what he did to me? I don't, but God does. And you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to forgive just the way he forgave you. Oh. Well, I'm not God, I know, but he lives in you, and here's the deal, that's what he's trying to build in you. That's what he's trying to accomplish in you every day that you're alive. Paul wrote this stuff over and over. Matter of fact, not far from where he wrote that, he said this, in your relationships with one another, he says, have the same mindset, again, as Christ Jesus. I don't want you to try to do it in your own power, and I don't want you to do it with your own definition. I want you to care for people in your relationships, just like Christ Jesus cared for people in his relationships. Can I just say this? If we could get this right, I can't even imagine what it would be like. If we get this right, all of a sudden, people want to work for you. They go, man, I'm not even sure I believe like that guy believes, but when I see how he treats people, I want to work for them. All of a sudden, people want you to work for them. They may not even believe in the God you believe in or the Bible you believe in, but they would say this, listen, when I watch that person, I want them on my team. Are you kidding me? <laughs> if you've got a teenage daughter or son, you're like, I want them to date that person, not because they're taller or short or this or that, but because of the way they treat people. If we do this right, it is contagious in a positive way. All of a sudden, if a church is that way, in the community, people don't roll their eyes and go, great, another church, like we needed one more of those. But if they see a community of people who follow Jesus treat people like Jesus treated people, all of a sudden they say, man, that's exactly what this community needs. I thought it was going to be electing somebody or passing another whatever bill or, or a legislation, but what the world needs if we want the world to change for people to follow through on the one commandment. And he said, it's not optional, it's what you must do. It's your only job. See, up to this point, it had always been. I'll be honest, sometimes it's the religion I grew up in. 
where people say, no, I love God, I follow God, I'm, the, I'm a mature Christian. There would be some great words for you. I'm a mature Christian, but it would make you say, well, then how do you speak to your wife that way? I heard you talking to your son. Your words say one thing, but your actions say something else. I watch you in the restaurant. I watch you in the place where you shop. I watch the way you drive down the road. I watch the way you do business. And you don't care for people like Christ said. And people would say, well, I'm, I'm, between me and God, all, all is good. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus has added this horizontal piece, and he says, what will define this for you? If you are who you say you are, then you will treat people the way Christ treated people. You will love them the way he loved them. That'll be your identifying piece. As a matter of fact, he left us with this statement, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It puts us to the point where we would say this. If you've been sitting in the room with Jesus that night, the, the guys are like drinking from a fire hose. It's like, man, this is, none of this is what we expected. I don't like it. Why do you have to keep doing stuff different? And Jesus is saying, listen, you need to listen right now. I'm giving you the bottom line, and it's a bottom line you need to know. There's only one thing you need to understand. When I was in high school, I ran track a little bit because I didn't have anything to do in part of the year, and it kept me out of school. I ran track. Our big track meet, our, our school hosted, and we never did that kind of stuff. So there were a lot of people, a lot of people in definition for high school track, which is not a lot of people, but a lot for us. The guy who did back in those times, they used a starting pistol. The guy who was in charge of that, something happened. They came and got him. They come to my coach and they, the coach says, hey, I need to get somebody to do this. My friend is standing right beside me. He says, hey, there's only two races left. Can you do this? He's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm thinking you're giving a gun to him. You've lost your stake in mind. He gets him over there. I walk over there with him. He goes, listen, it's already low. All you got to do is pull the trigger, ready, mark, set, fire the gun. You got one job. Just watch me. I'll give you that. Is that ready? Set, boom. Okay. And so everybody gets set. We get down to the biggest race of the whole day, which is a big deal, but, you know, for high school track. Everybody's in their spots. Everybody's watching. Little tension. It's a, it's a sprint, so guys are down in the blocks. Everybody's ready to go. And gives them the cue. My friends, I'm going to take your mark. Get set. All right, everybody, hang on just a minute. Everybody stands back up. All the crowd's like, you've got to be kidding. He walks over to my friend. I walk over with him, and, and he says, uh, you didn't pull the trigger back. And my friend's like, oh, sorry. And he says, you had one job to do, right? <laughs> one stupid job to do. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, listen, I've taught you so much. We've done so much. Now I've got, I'm going to leave you with one job to do. I want you to love others the way that I've loved you. And when he looked at him, he could have easily looked at him and said, Matthew, hey, Matthew, look, Matthew. Matthew, you remember what you were doing when I first met you? And Peter's probably over here going, yeah, he was a pain in the butt. We hate it. Shut up, Peter. Yes, sir, I was, I was, you know. Say it, Matthew. Go on and say it. I was a tax collector. What were you doing? I was kind of ripping off my own people. Yeah. Matthew, what did I invite you to do? You invited me to be one of your followers, one of your closest friends, one of your family. Do you remember where we went that day? Matthew, yeah. You came to my house. Peter's like, yeah, I hated that. It was so embarrassing. Shut up, Peter. You came to my house with people who were like me, and you had time for me and my friends. He goes, that's right, Matthew. And now you've got one job, only one job. I want you to love other people. How? The same way I loved you. The same way I forgave you. The same way I made room for you in my world. I want you to do it for others. I want you to do it for the easy ones and the difficult ones. The ones a lot like you and the ones not like you at all. He goes through Nathaniel. Yes, sir. Nathaniel. You remember what happened? Peter's like, oh, I couldn't believe he's... Shut up, Peter. Nathaniel, you remember what you said about me? You insulted me. You insulted my home. 
Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? You insulted my little league team, my mama and daddy. You insulted everything. And you remember what I said to you? You said, come with you and follow you and you'd make me part of your family. That's right, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, I've got one job for you now. I just want you to love others the way that I've loved you. Even people who say stupid things. Even people who post ridiculous things online. Even people who disparage things that I love. I want you to love them the way I've loved you. You understand? James. John. Remember when I found you, you were mending the nets? Remember what I said? You said, yes, sir. Come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter's like, I didn't even know what you're talking about. Who wants to be a fisher of men? Be quiet, Peter. Remember? You remember when I was teaching everybody about in my economy, the last to be first and the first to be a member, and then you guys step up and go, I want to be first anyway. I want to be first. James and John, remember what I did? Yeah. You straightened me out and you loved me. James and John, all I want you to do is one thing. I want you to love others the way I've loved you. And Peter, you know all about everything. You've got an answer for everything. But Peter, you have no idea what you're going to do in the next 24 hours. Peter, here's the truth. Before the night's out, you're going to completely deny me three times. Peter's like, you must have, you've lost your mind. You've lost it completely, sir. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Peter, it's okay because you know what I'm going to do. It's going to break my heart that you would do that, but with my broken heart, I'm going to forgive you. I've got room for your failure in my world. And Peter, I say all that because I want to tell you this. I need for you to love people who are going to deny you. I need for you to love people who you invest in who don't invest back. I need for you to love people who don't understand. I need for you to love people who don't get it. I need for you to love people the way I've loved you. That's the way I want you to do it. Can you imagine what would happen if the, all the people watching this right now would just in their homes? If you just get done with this, if you just look around at the people in your home or look around at your neighbors or look around at the people in your community and say, I'm not going to get it all right. I know I'm not going to get it all right. But this day, this day and tomorrow, I'm going to get up and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at people. I'm just going to try to love them as best I can. The way that Jesus loved me. And I may not do it perfect, but that's the way I'm going to spend my life. And where I'm wrong, I'm going to own it and adjust. And if it means I've got to quit being like me sometimes, I'm going to try to be more like him. Don't underestimate what God could do with a group of people who would just love people. Matter of fact, just a few verses later in your Bible from where we read this, it says that the entire city of Jerusalem was turned upside down. And you know why? It wasn't because they quoted a bunch of verses and it wasn't because they had this great brilliant strategy of how to reach a whole city. It's because a bunch of people started loving each other the way that God had loved them. And when they did, it was contagious. It went from being appalling to being very appealing. And it went from being very appealing to very contagious. And 2,000 years later, it's still affecting lives like mine. Can I just ask you, who does God want you to love this day the way that he loved you? Who does God want you in your workplace, in your home, in your extended family of crazy people? In your difficult spots, in your easy spots, who is it? right now that God wants you to love. Don't underestimate what he would do because if you will do the one thing well, he will heap upon you opportunities to make a difference in the world where you live. If you feel like my life is lacking a little purpose, there's only one purpose to pursue and when you pursue it, God will bring contentment and peace to your life, but not till then. You got one job. You got one stinking job. Spend your life fulfilling the one commandment and your life will be well spent let's pray so god help us i kind of stink at that sometimes sometimes i'm pretty good at it then sometimes i get so caught up in my own world and then sometimes i like to identify my neighbor by whoever i want and then sometimes i like to love people the way i want to be loved not the way they need to be loved and i just pray that you would help me if i mess up everything else in life would you help me succeed at this one thing that i love people the way you love me and I'm so grateful for how you love me. I ask it in your name. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching.